Hello, this is Daily Devotion for Thursday, July 1st. Our reading this morning comes to us from Romans, the first chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. And again, a warning like I gave yesterday, today's devotion deals with some fairly mature themes. And so you might want to give some thought to whether everyone around you should be listening to this right now. Um, likewise, you don't have to agree with everything I say here, but this is my considered opinion based on four years of seminary, and 22 years of experience in the field and wrestling with what is really one of the more difficult passages of Scripture. And the reason I chose this is to tie into what we had yesterday, a passage from Ezekiel, talking about how the people of Israel had whored themselves out to foreign gods and gotten nothing for it, in fact, had wound up all the poorer because of it. This is the theme that is also picked up by Paul in our reading today. However, this is one of the most controversial passages of Scripture because it is one of the very few that deals with homosexuality. And so I want you to try to listen to this with the freshest ears you possibly can, not knowing, while well, trying to forget at least, what the church has traditionally taught about homosexuality, and just listen to this passage as though you had never heard it before. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse, for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the, dire, the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, contentious, covet, covetousness, malice. Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's decrees, that those who practice such things deserve to die. Yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Okay, if you listen to that with a fresh set of ears, what would you say that passage is primarily about? If you said, this passage is primarily about how wrong homosexuality is, then you did not listen to it with a fresh set of ears. Because this could not plainly or more clearly be about pagan worship than it is. It's spelled out right there. And while, yes, Paul does mention homosexuality in the middle of it, it's clear from the context that he sees the fact that women were having sex with women and men were having sex with men as a symptom of a problem they already had, and not as a problem in and of itself. And it is one sin among many mentioned in this passage. Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, to a church that had two groups of people, one of whom had been pagans before they became Christian, and the other who had been Jewish. These were two groups that had never liked each other, and now, through having come to know Jesus Christ, found themselves having to exist side by side. This passage talks about what pagan worship was like, and it points out how people knew that God had created the universe, but decided to worship his creation instead of worshiping the one who created it. Crafting for themselves idols sometimes looking like humans, like the ancient Greek and Roman gods, other times looking like animals of various kinds, with a reference here being to the many 
fertility cults of the Canaanite religion and the Hittite religion, etc., 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 that were very common in the Mediterranean Middle East area at that time. The people of Israel themselves have been tempted over to this side of the fence of paganism many times in their history. And part of pagan worship, particularly with the fertility cults, was ritualized prostitution. This was a fundraiser, in essence, for these pagan temples. It was expected that everyone who belonged to the cult would take their turn as being a temple prostitute. In fact, in most cases, it was required. Some people made this a profession. They made a habit of it. Most simply did their duty and then went home. But one of the rules of these cults was that you had to go have sex with whoever paid for you. You couldn't refuse anyone's money. So you might have to have sex with someone you weren't attracted to. You know, if you were a man, you might have to have sex with a woman you didn't find attractive. If you were a woman, you might have to have sex with a man you didn't find attractive. If you were a man and a man paid for you, guess what? If you were a woman and a woman paid for you, guess what? And what Paul is talking about here is that these people's refusal to acknowledge God's presence led them to do things that they did not want to do. It made them hypersexual, sometimes by choice, but sometimes by force. And it caused them to receive what is described rather euphemistically as receiving in their own person the due penalty for their error, in other words, catching social diseases. And that's what Paul has to say about it. It's noteworthy that this is the only mention of female homosexuality in all of Scripture. But when we look at this passage, does it really work in the ways that people want to make it work? What's being condemned here on a blanket basis? It's not homosexuality. It's paganism. And at the very end, there's this whole laundry list of things that people are doing because they refuse to acknowledge God, they refuse to acknowledge his law, and... Wow. Not only is homosexuality on that list, even adultery isn't on that list. They know God's decree, but those practice, who practice such things deserve to die. If they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. I have heard this passage quoted as saying that everyone who in any way does not condemn homosexuality in the world is part of this. But what are these, what are these things? Wickedness, evil, covetous, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, gossip, slander, God-hating, insolence, haughtiness, boastfulness, inventing evil, rebelliousness towards parents, foolishness, faithlessness, heartlessness, ruthlessness. These are the things that Paul is condemning and saying that they applaud people who practice them. Now, I want to be clear. You cannot anywhere in Scripture find an out-and-out -out endorsement of homosexuality. But there's a great danger in taking this passage out of, out of its context and making it do something that it simply was not written to do. It was written to point out to the pagans that their ways up until now have been wrong. It follows, by the way, that Paul turned around, pointed to his Jewish brothers and sisters and said, by the way, you're really not any better because your life has been full of dead ritual and a lack of compassion. A charge that could very easily still be levied against the church today. Yeah, there's enough in the book of Romans, the first two chapters, to make everyone feel like, I'd better watch myself. Don't make this passage say something it doesn't. Don't say it doesn't say something it does, but don't make it say something it doesn't or do something it was not written to do. There is a great danger in turning away from God. There's also a great danger in putting God in a box and deciding that our human understanding of God is better than his sovereignty. Let us pray. Lord, all these things that we don't always understand. And sometimes we hear your word and we misuse it. We don't use it in the way that you intended it to be used. 
We take one or two verses out of context, decide they support something we already support, and ignore what it was you were trying to say. This isn't the only passage of Scripture we've done this with, Lord, but it's always wrong. So we pray that you would teach us to worry about ourselves and not about others, to focus on our own relationship with you and on striving every day to become better Christians, as opposed to complaining about all the people around us, because that gets nowhere. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon.